Thank you very much, Stephen. And perfect timekeeping there, I would say. Uh, Paul's already warned me that uh, there might be a bit of aggressive uh, timekeeping necessary, so if you see me gesticulating wildly at him, don't think uh, there's a fire in the auditorium or anything. So I'll just hand you straight over to Paul now. Sorry. Other way, okay, right. Well, first of all, I mean, first of all, to to say uh, a very heartfelt thank you to the um, National Secular Society for the opportunity to speak to you all, and also for the great honour of being uh, declared the Secularist of the Year uh, earlier this year. I'd like to formally compliment the, the Society on its advocacy work, and in particular, its uh, focus on the issue of uh, a, the, the legal requirement for a, 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 um, a daily act of compulsory collective, mainly Christian worship, in all state-funded schools. Um, uh, I think this is a really important issue for all educators, and I really congratulate the, the Society for for, for identifying it. In terms of this, this talk, I'd like to just cover three areas. Um, firstly, I think it's probably important to tell you briefly the story of Educate Together um, and it, its experience over the past 40 years in Ireland. Um, I won't go into, into great detail. The paper I'll leave with the society will go into the intricacies of the, the Irish state-funded public system in more detail. Secondly, I'd like to explore somewhat of, of what I think are the fundamental concepts upon which teachers and educators can and should be basing policy and practice. And lastly, I'd like to just raise with you some issues which I think have become obligations for teachers and educators in the world today. So to get started, uh, for those of you who don't know about Educate Together, Educate Together is um, an organization that was started 40 years ago by a small group of young parents and teachers who got together at school gates and in, around kitchen tables in a suburb of, of Dublin to create a new model of primary uh, education, which was a fundamentally equality-based. Ireland at the time was a society dominated by clerical authority, uh, and its education system was staunchly conservative. Ireland was a country that was becoming increasingly traumatized by the political conflict and violence in Northern Ireland, and that was a conflict which was rapidly taking on a, a horrific, awful, and increasingly religiously sectarian nature. Um, the Irish state-funded primary education system was universally faith-based. All public-funded schools had a religious ethos, either Protestant or Catholic. Uh, rights of parents to absent their children from religious instruction in schools had been effectively ran, uh, uh, rendered ineffective. The parents of the Educate Together founding group were determined to provide something better for their children. They wanted an education which would be free from religious indoctrination, was modern and innovative, and would enable children from all backgrounds to grow confident in an atmosphere of respect and equality. They adopted the name Educate Together. The, 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 the model of primary education they created was, faced, was based on four fundamental legal principles. And one of the great assets of this, this group was that they very clearly defined uh, the legal basis on which they would proceed. First of all, and the prime directive, was equality of access and esteem to children irrespective of their social, cultural, or religious backgrounds. Secondly, that the pedagogy and curriculum would be based on the real-time educational needs of the children and not restricted by a predefined national curriculum. And that the school would be managed in a child-centered way, placing the best interests of the child at the center of all school policy. Thirdly, that the schools would be co-educational 
and committed to encouraging all children to explore the full range of their abilities, irrespective of role stereotyping, either of gender, sexuality, or of any other social role. And lastly, that the schools would be run as far as possible as participatory democracies, in which the voice of students, parents, and staff have power in decision making. And this would model active citizenship and systematically embrace the role of the family and the community in the learning process. From very small beginnings, with a small school, um, this is the original document, um, in a small school, um, uh, uh, this movement fought to be able to exist and to demonstrate that it is possible to operate a successful school on the basis of principles of human rights and equality. The odds stacked against it were just enormous. It took vast amounts of voluntary effort and fundraising to become the established movement that it is today. Nowadays, Educate Together is an educational social enterprise and a popular movement. It is independent, not-for-profit, and has charitable status. It operates a rapidly growing national network of 81 primaries and, and nine secondary schools. All its schools are state-funded, or I should really say state-underfunded, and, <laughs> and, and non-fee charging. Its unique characteristics are the clarity of its legal definition and its, education, its ethical education curriculum. This is called the Learn Together Ethical Education Curriculum at primary level, which is now covered in all colleges of primary teacher education and has been recognized by the EU as an example of best practice in cult intercultural education. In recent years, um, this sort of gives you an idea of the type of campaigning that went on. Um, that's our national parliament and that's actually representatives of every single major political party in support of our campaign to open our first second level school. And this is the, uh, this is the scope of our network as it was, uh, sorry, as it was last week. There's, there's, there's nine more last week. Um, in recent years, has Educate Together uh, uh, has become the education model of choice for a rapidly increasing number of families. Since the turn of the century, it has opened 72 new schools, and just this week, it has opened five new secondary and four new primary schools. It is providing a human rights and equality-based alternative to an overwhelming monopoly of faith-based education in which, still in 21st century democratic state in the developed world, you could describe it as an ex-colonial, the, 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 the one example of an ex-colonial state within the developed world, 97% uh, of primary schools remained owned and controlled by religious bodies, 93% of those are Catholic and 5% Protestant. And in nine out of 10 areas of the country, a parent has no choice at all but to send to their child to a school that is legally obliged to promote and prefer a specific religious non denomination throughout the entire school program. Now, whilst this, education, this, this situation is rightly considered extraordinary and unacceptable in the modern world, it is unfortunately not unique. The continued legal obligation in England to have a daily act of mainly Christian collective worship represents a similar violation of the rights of children to intellectual and religious freedom. However, I'm sure as you appreciate, this presents a profound human rights challenge to parents and teachers in Ireland. It affects a rapidly increasing number of young parents who are astounded to encounter this when setting about choosing a school for their children. And as a result, a number of campaigns have emerged over the past year, and these are building on the tremendous success of last year's uh, you know, historic marriage equality referendum. In Ireland, we're now embarking on an ambitious plan to build a national network of 300 schools that will enable all families to access an equality-based school within 30 minutes travel in the morning. And to do so, we're currently, on a, this is my main work these days, is actively seeking a two million uh, euro investment to fund the next 30 schools. Our projections will show that with this support, we will rapidly approach a tipping point that will generate a self-sustaining momentum of system change which can conclusively resolve this human rights deficit in Irish education. And at the same time, 
We are actively seeking friends, supporters, funders, and like-minded educationalists in the UK and other countries to partner with us in making ethical, equality-based education a real option for parents in other parts of the world. And in this regard, as Stephen's just mentioned, we have opened our first school in the UK in Bristol. We will open two more next year, and we are very open to cooperation with other human rights-based schools and educationalists and other initiatives in, in the UK. So that's, that's where we are in, in Educate Together. Now, I'd like to talk about some fundamental issues around education and why it's so important to assert a proper relationship between the rights of the individual and the individual learner and the obligations of a system. And I hope you can agree with me on three starting axioms. Now, the first one is that human ability is scattered roughly equally across all people in the world, irrespective of wealth, ethnicity, race, or cultural background. I think it is true to say that all those who have tried to prove the opposite over the past centuries, sometimes to justify discrimination on racial or ethnic grounds, have repeatedly been proven wrong. The second is that the scope of human ability is not finite. That is, that no teacher, no curriculum, no system or model can set limits to the extent of the progress of an individual child or learner. And the third one, which I'm sure you can agree with me on, is that no child chooses their parents. No child chooses their skin color. No child chooses their ethnicity. No child chooses any part of their genetic makeup. No child chooses their home language or the features, or the, or the features of their birth culture. No child chooses their family's religious viewpoint. And no child chooses whether they are to be born into a world of wealth or a world of social deprivation. Following from these, I think it shows that modern education must start from a fundamental obligation to respect and cherish the rights of the individual child, and an education system must have its, as its core objective to draw out this ability, this ability that is by definition untapped and unknown. Now, I'm making this argument from a systemic point of view, but I'm making it also from a straightforward moral and ethical view, which I think is fully, uh, fully uh, supported by hard, that, the, these hard scientific axioms. But I'm also making this from the point of view of economics and social economics. A simple review of the performance of education systems shows that if they're to be efficient, the social profile of those entering the system should be roughly equal to the social profile of those exiting it, exiting it at whatever stage. Now, all the evidence I know about the uh, education systems in the world is education systems are demonstrably inefficient in this regard. And what does this mean? In short, cultural barriers within the system are preventing its efficiency, and society is almost by definition failing to benefit from a very significant part of its human and its breadth of its human capital. So how do we create a learning environment that encapsulates a modern education and respect for, for human rights? Educate Together's experience is that firstly, school, schools must start from a legal and public commitment to equality of access and esteem. This must be more than a mission statement on the wall. It must be binding. It must also be lived out in the daily life of a school and upheld in practice uh, by staff and management. In Ireland, we are lucky that, we, that there is now no statutory obstacle in, to implementing this. In the UK, the current exemption from equality legislation for compulsory worship in schools is a real difficulty. Secondly, a school must create a safe space in which children can explore difficult moral and ethical questions and inter interrogate diff different ideological and theoretical perspectives. These spaces must go beyond simple accommodation or tolerance and must facilitate kind, respectful, friendly engagement with ideas and attitudes. This is a critical multicultural approach which, when practiced fully, enables children to develop real understanding of different viewpoints, to learn, to appreciate issues, wearing another person's shoes, 
to develop real skills of collaboration which produces young people who are confident and comfortable living and working with people of widely differing backgrounds and family histories. Thirdly, a school must have a real values proposition and a curriculum to deliver it. Secularists in education must have a values proposition. Discourse around human rights, sustainability and equality does provide a rich space of shared ethics and morality. This more than adequately fills the so-called ethical vacuum which is alleged by supporters of faith-based schooling and education systems uh, which would be created if the faith element allegedly would be taken away. Over the years, Educate Together has developed a primary level edu ethical education curriculum called the Learn Together curriculum. As I said, um, it has been tested over many years against a real multiplicity of viewpoints in our schools in Ireland. We, uh, just by, by reality of economics, we operate some of the, the most massively multicultural schools in the country. It is taught each day and its values permeate the whole school program. It takes its fundamental standpoint essentially from the, the values of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It has four strands, moral and spiritual development, equality and justice, belief systems, which is a rich program of intercultural studies, which includes non-theistic, atheist, humanistic, and agnostic viewpoints, and ethics and the environment, which this, this embraces the objectives of education for sustainability. The key to the success of this curriculum lies in its negotiation and implementation at local levels. Schools are challenged to implement its core values and its education philosophy. So lastly, I wanted to try and engage with you that this generation of children entering our schools this year is unique. In most countries of the world, about half of them will see the 22nd century. About half of the girls in schools today will live beyond 100 years old. The indications are that this generation will be as lively and productive in their, in their 80s as we expect to be in our 60s. The next 80 years or so are likely to be one of the most exciting in human history. This generation in schools today will be encountering, encountering unprecedented, unprecedented rates of technological, social, geographical, and economic change. Just look back at the last 40 years and consider what has utterly changed our working and recreational lives. Mobile phones, the power of personal devices, the ease of transport, and the movement of people. The ease of instant, cheap communications to almost any part of the world. <clears throat> the future for the reception class of 2016 is one which will see even greater speed of human device interaction, cheaper renewable energy, better nutrition and healthcare, and a rate of technolo technological change and scientific discovery that their grandparents would have found unimaginable. The areas of big data, artificial intelligence, and automation are already beginning to profoundly transform what we currently consider to be a working life. All the indications available to us suggest that they and their children, and perhaps their grandchildren, will be the generations that will either succeed or fail to ensure the survival of humanity as a species. So this generation of school children must be empowered to solve the issues of economic, social, and environmental sustainability as people, as families, as communities, countries, and as part of, a multiple, of, of multiple global communities. We have to trust them, acknowledge that what was appropriate for education systems in the past is no longer relevant, and give them the intellectual, physical, and social skills to enable them to do so. This question of ethical education, an educational approach that is confident to uphold the universal values of equality, respect for difference, respect for the intellectual and religious freedoms of the, of the individual, is really important in today's world. It's not neutral or unbiased. It, sh it should stand firm and proudly uphold these as fundamental values. It should reject intolerance, racism, xenophobia, and all those who seek to curtail intellectual and religious freedoms. It should bring forward a generation of children who are sure of their own identity and confident to enter civic spaces and global spaces 
in which they can dialogue constructively with those who disagree with them, but to do so with respect and kindness. If we can achieve that, then we are at least providing this generation with some of the key skills that they will need to resolve the history which we will bequeath them. So I think I've run out of, the rest is on, uh, in the paper, but thank you very much for the opportunity to just raise some of these issues with you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion.